Hello, friends, and welcome to part three of my Omnipod 5 Ask the Experts series. Far too often, community-sourced answers to Omnipod 5 questions contain misinformation. So today we're going to help to set the record straight by bringing in an expert who works at Omnipod. And Melissa doesn't just work at Omnipod. She also has type 1 diabetes, wears Omnipod 5, and she wrote the user manual. So sit back while Melissa and I go over the questions that I see most frequently asked online about the Omnipod 5 algorithm. Insulet has paid the host of this podcast, Scott Benner, a fee to create this content. This podcast provides general information and discussion about health and related subjects. This information and other content provided in this podcast or in any linked materials are not intended and should not be construed as medical advice, nor is the information a substitute for professional medical expertise or treatment. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something that you've heard in this podcast or read in any linked materials. The opinions and views expressed on this podcast and website have no relation to those of any academic, hospital, health practice, or other institution. Please speak with your healthcare team if you or any other person has a medical concern and before making any changes to your diabetes management and consult the Omnipod 5 Automated Insulin Delivery System User Guide for more information. Nothing you hear on the Juicebox Podcast or read on juiceboxpodcast.com is intended as medical advice. You should always consult a physician before making changes to your health care plan. Hi, Scott. Thank you so much for having me today. My name is Melissa Lee, and I am the Senior Manager of Instructional Design at Insulet. What that means is that I lead all of our uh, training materials and um, user guides and all of the written instructions for how to actually use the products that we uh, sell at Insulet. And uh, I've lived with type 1 diabetes for 33 years. I was diagnosed when I was 10 years old. So now I've told you that, well, I'm 44. Um, and uh, I've used so much diabetes technology in my life. I have been working in the diabetes uh, med device industry for about eight years or so. And before that, uh, I was a blogger and a, and a diabetes advocate and someone who worked in the diabetes nonprofit sector. So I'm a huge proponent of trying to find ways to make these devices actually work for us and our community. Yeah. And that's who I am and what I do. This doesn't happen very often, but we know each other like from years ago. So years ago. Yeah. Yeah. We, we were doing stuff that uh, back then I don't think anybody was doing. Honestly, a very, very select group of people were writing blogs. It grew eventually. Do you know, I have this information because uh, a pharma company told it to me one time, but at its height, at its height, there were over 4,000 type 1 diabetes blogs. Oh, my goodness. Isn't that goodness. insane? I remember when there were Five. 10. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really interesting. Um, and then some people, it's interesting, too, because, like, I, I kind of went with it. I saw blogging sort of be like, eh, this isn't going to keep happening. And I went to the podcast. And But you went into industry. You've worked at a number of different places now. Um, I have. Yeah, you have. So um, how did you make your way to Omnipod? So I, um, this, uh, this is going to sound very Goldilocksy. This is my dream job. I am so excited to be um, a part of Insulet. And when, when we were, um, when I first joined Insulet two and a half years ago, we were trying to get Omnipod 5 through, um, uh, you know, through the FDA and trying to sort of put finishing touches on this product that was going to help so many people. And I was so excited to get to use this product because I, um, obviously I, I've used a lot of different AID systems over the years. I've always tried to be an early adopter of whatever is hot in, in diabetes tech. And, um, I mean, I've used, oh gosh, I've used something like eight CGMs and, and 16 insulin pumps. Mm. And so Omnipod 5 was like, I have to try this. I have to get it. So, so I was one of the first people to get to use Omnipod 5 and that was really exciting. Um, but, and, and you're still wearing it actually, now? I am oh, okay. to get to, to, to get to actually um, work on a product that was going to be in people's hands and changing people's lives was very meaningful to me with my past advocacy work. 
um, you know, for, for a lot of the work I've done, I, I just really wanted to know that, that what I was working on would really have an impact for people. And so it's been exciting to, to be able to launch Omnipod 5 in, you know, in multiple countries at this point and to get to work on all of those launches. So I joined Insulate actually with, um, a slightly different role. I came in to be, um, sort of a, a, an, a disruptor in the way that Insulate had historically rolled out some of the training initiatives that it has done for Omnipod products. As we were moving into automated insulin delivery, there was this opportunity to really sort of uh, innovate on training for AID systems like Omnipod 5 and, and other future things will roll out. And um, that was super exciting for me. And then through the process of taking Omnipod 5 through the FDA, we identified some needs and developed a new team that I actually had the opportunity to charter. And so my team is instructional design and, and we get to do not just the user guides, but um, e-learning and how-to videos and and all that and kind stuff of stuff like this. Yeah. Well, you, no better person to ask than, than the person who not just wrote the book about it, but had to write it from the perspective of an actual user. I think that's a really big um, a point to make, honestly, that you're not just... Right. You're not just somebody who was tasked and sitting down and explaining ABC, but you, you got to think about it. And you guys have, you know, can you talk about that a little bit? Like how your experience using the device helps you talk about it to other people? Oh, absolutely. You know, I think um, it, one of the most fascinating things to me, and so as as someone who has done a lot of diabetes advocacy, you know, people will come to me and um, and say things like, well, how do I how do I work for a company? And, uh, you know, will they hire me as a diabetes advocate? And I'm like, there's not like a, you know, a golden cushion you sit on all day and you advocate for people with diabetes. I need people on the engineering team who are advocates for people who have diabetes. I need people on our market access team who are advocates for people who are who have diabetes. So, like, I encourage people who are interested in working in the industry, who are part of our community to think about, like, well, what skills do I have while I could also be an advocate for people with diabetes? So uh, that experience has been things like we might be writing at a certain, um, we might be writing about a certain thing. Um, I'll give you a great example. And maybe people who have used the Omnipod Dash system and they moved to Omnipod 5, they may have noticed small changes in wording. Um, things like instead of saying you have a low reservoir, like we say on Omnipod Dash, we say you have low pod insulin on Omnipod 5. And so there were a lot of things that the team at large did to simplify the language that we use mm -hmm. so that more people could understand it, more people could access it. And that means bringing down like the grade level readability of things so that you don't have to already know what an insulin reservoir is to understand that your pod's low on insulin. Right. So that's some of the stuff that my my team and, and my colleagues and I have been working on is um, like, you know, how will we help more people succeed and 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 like learn to use these products well is that an indication that in in past that there was engineer speak in the direction like it was yeah there was i would say um in and, and this is really typical of what i've seen in medical device is that very often you've got um really brilliant systems and and engineers like who do technical writing who are describing the system functionality mm -hmm. And I like to describe it like um, if if I were a technical writer and I were describing how your remote control works for your television, that I might say, um, here's the power button in the upper left corner. This is what it works, how it works. This is how you use it. Here's the button right next to it. It's the source button. Here's the button right next to it. It's the this button. Here's the button right next. To it. Instead of what do I need as a person with diabetes? I need to know how to turn on the TV. I need to know how to change the channel. I need to know how to increase the volume. And I'll deal with all that other stuff at the appropriate time for me to deal with it. Okay. Like, I don't need to know these advanced settings as the first thing out of the gate. Mm -hmm. And so there's a different approach you take when you're writing for people who who actually have to use the product in certain use cases. Yeah. And we've got lots of teams that kind of work on that, um, but that's that's a good part of it. I, I always say I go to websites sometimes, and I think, did they not use the website after they designed it? <laughs> like you, you know, like like didn't someone try it afterwards to see if it actually helped the person who needed it? So let's take all that experience you have and put it to work on the questions that I see pretty frequently online in the in Juice Box Podcast Facebook group and other places on social media. Some of the things that I read, and I think. I don't think that's right, but uh, we'll ask you because you'll know for sure. Ready? You want to dive into this? 
I'm ready. Okay, here's the first one. The Omnipod 5 Systems Adaptivity. Is that right? No. Yep. Yes. How come I can't read? Uh, it takes a long time to work. Restarting my system will set me back months. So I guess this is somebody saying, I'm waiting for the thing to learn and do what I want it to do. And now I'm thinking, should I just reset it and start over? Do you hear people talk about that a lot? Absolutely. Um, you know, I think that, uh, I think a lot of people have started products and not just Omnipod 5. I think this is common across the automated insulin delivery sector where, you know, we're working with our healthcare providers on what those settings should be when we start. But the settings are really optimized for the way we were using standard insulin pumps. And mm -hmm. they may not actually be optimized for how these different algorithms work. And so if you're starting the system and your settings are not, uh, you know, quite dialed in where they need to be, that initial adaptivity that you experienced when you started a product like Omnipod 5, it, it seemed to take a while for you to get to, you know, there, there are some people who feel like it takes longer than they thought it should to mm -hmm. get to where they need to be. And so then they're afraid to, well, I'd love to move to like the Android smartphone, but then I'll have to start over on my adaptivity or, you know, insulin sent me a new device because mine broke and I, but now I'm going to have to restart that activity and I don't want to spend months and months doing that again. So the important thing to understand is that if your settings are pretty well dialed in, it should only take a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. And so really the system looks back over about four or five pods. I mean, it looks it looks back at your history, but it's really those four or five most recent pods that it's sort of calculating your total daily insulin based on. So what your adaptivity is based on is how much insulin you use in a day. And so if you know that information, then you should be able to kind of like come back in when you make that transition or or if you choose to reset your system and and be able to come back in you shouldn't you shouldn't take months and months to hit that so, stride in your adaptivity so that's a concern that it sounds to me like it it stems from i mean I, i'll give an example like let's say that your total daily insulin should be 60 units but for some reason you're using 40 units then you never really had a ton of success on whatever system you were using before and now you move to Omnipod 5, you tell it, hey, I need 40 units of insulin a day, but you need 60. And so it can't magically know you're wrong about that. And so it, you need to come along and say, oh, gosh, like, that's not right. You bolus more. And then the system sees, oh, wow, OK, they put in more insulin here. Maybe the total daily insulin's more like a larger number. But it's not going to find out your it's not going to figure out your 60 in five minutes. And is that right? So you're that's right. And you wouldn't yeah. want it to. Right, Scott? I mean, the, the, yeah. that's so scary that it could make a change that's very sudden. You know, one of the things that we certainly have heard from people before is, um, oh, well, you know, what if I what if I'm sick for a week or what if I have a really bad weekend or a really wild weekend and like my insulin needs were really different? Like, I don't want it to suddenly change what it's delivering. Well, that's why it looks back over a few pods. It's yeah. not making a decision based on right now. But if for the last couple of months, your job has been stressful or you've been moving or you're going through a divorce or like whatever might have might have given your body a different level of, of need in your insulin, you should see these things slowly get to where you've indicated by the amount of insulin that you're using that you need to be. Right. And so that's, you know, it, reasonably, it's how you want it to work. Um, but you know, we, we tend to be, we want that immediate gratification sometimes. So it's, it's hard. So then let's maybe move forward with that assumption that somebody came in and they didn't use enough insulin to set the system up with. And it's a, I don't know, an egregious amount, an amount that's going to take a long time for the system to, to say, oh, wow, it, it's more like 60. What, what do they do in that situation? Like we talked about, like you might have to reset it if your device changes or something like that, but is there a world where that would be a a reasonable way to move forward, like if you made that mistake initially? Well, you know, we we definitely, as you know, Insulet encourages people to, to talk to their healthcare team about what these settings are, mm -hmm. especially since we're providing additional education to healthcare providers as well about the settings, you know, and all AID systems work a little bit differently. And so one of the things that um, people automatically think is that they should go in and adjust certain settings and that that will change what the algorithm is doing. And and there are settings you can adjust, but it may not be the first settings that you reach for. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, my first line of defense would be to check those other settings to see if you can 
um, you know, adjust them in a way that will help you get to where you need to be before you go to a hard reset. But a hard reset, or just like when you're switching, you know, we don't think switching devices is a problem. Obviously, there's, you know, there's flexibility in the configuration that you use. So if you get a new phone and you want to move to that new phone, like you should be able to do that safely. Um, but, uh, you know, I I know that some people are sort of like, they may feel like they need to reset often. And I would say if that's the case, then there's probably other settings that needed to be adjusted in the yeah. first place. Yeah, if, settings, if that's, I mean, just from my perspective, settings are wrong or the way you're implementing the insulin is, is maybe a question. We're going to get back to this line of conversation. I know later with a, with, with another question, but I'm going to move forward a little bit here and then we'll kind of get back to this and, and build on it a little more. Um, I think we're going to like dig into the word learn because this next question I've, I've genuinely heard this a thousand times. I heard that Omnipod 5 algorithm will learn me. Does this mean that smart adjust technology will learn my patterns? And the example given here is like, you know, that I eat oatmeal in the morning or that I go high in the afternoon. Is it going to learn like the, you know, like out of a movie? <laughs> it's, what it, it's what it feels like it's they're asking a, me. You know? Well, you know, it, it's such an honest question because we're living in this world where AI is suddenly sort of breaking in and we're hearing about all of these like learning tools and, and you know, chat robots and everything that are learning. And it's not anything like that. The way that Omnipod 5 and and we don't really say that it learns, but it's updating. It's it's uh, it's adapting to you over time. So every time you put a new pod on, it's looking back over that history and it's learning only one thing. It's updating your total daily insulin, which we call TDI. And so you know, as if you mentioned, you mentioned the person who starts out programs in that they take forty units a day, and really this person's optimal use might be sixty units a day. So over time, it's going to uh, to see that you're taking more insulin and it's going to reset your adaptive basal rate based on a new understanding based on your last few pods. So the what it's learning is your total daily insulin. It's not learning that, oh, he does, you know, racquetball on Tuesday afternoons, so I need to make sure that I change a basal rate, um, you know, at that time of day. It's yeah. saying oh, he seems to be taking more like 50 units a day. So I'm going to take a certain percentage of that and I'm going to divide it into 24 hours and that's you're going to get a flat rate. And I think that's a big piece that people may not understand. Oh, for sure. The adaptive basal rate is a flat per hour rate. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's the amount that's designated as your basal divided by 24. Now from there... It adjusts up and down based on your glucose. And so that's why you wear a compatible sensor with Omnipod 5 so that you can get that um, information. What's really interested, uh, interesting about this is that um, when you look at when the system doesn't have that uh, data from your sensor, it still can go off of some of what it, what it's learned. Mm -hmm. Learned, I say in quotation right, marks, right, right. but it, it it's still looking at your um, total daily insulin. Yeah, that's really amazing. Honestly, it's... It's fantastic. It's just that when people, I think it's that word. I really do. It learns, makes people think, just like you said, like somehow magically, it just, it's watching everything and it knows. And th that's a great explanation. I appreciate that very much. It's a great explanation of how simply the algorithm sees what's happening and makes adjustments moving forward and that it takes time and, and it, it can only yeah. know what you told it. In the beginning. Exactly. Right. I, I often think about, so I have a lot of smart home stuff in my home and, you know, I have a smart thermostat and um, I was getting really cranky because I was feeling cold at night. We had a cold front come in. I'm in the Austin, Texas area. We had a cold front in and, and suddenly I'm very cranky that it's, that it's cold. Like my system should know that it's cold and it should. And then I, I checked the settings and my thermostat had quote learned to be at about 69 in the evening. So I'm like, well, that's too cold when it's cold outside. So what do I do? I come in and I tell it something different. And then the next night it was 69 again. What do I do? I come in and tell it something different. And after me telling it a few times, it it switches over and now it's 71 instead of 69. Oh. But it doesn't, like, it's not sitting there thinking, I bet Melissa's feeling cold because of the cold front right now. You know, I'm just going to nudge it up a little bit because she likes her toes toasty. Like it's not doing anything like that. You know, right? in the South, it's so warm in the summer and then it shifts and it gets cold here in Austin. And I don't want Melissa to be uncomfortable. And yeah, no, <laughs> it, it is hard not to consider. I mean, I don't think that's how people consciously consider it, but I do think it's how they expect it to work. 
So yeah. I, I appreciate well, that. Well, it's very how we'd much. love for it to work, right? I mean, yeah. you really love for systems to be able to do that. And that's not, you know, that's not what we have right. today. Well, maybe one day you'll be able to just run out the door and yell, Omnipod. I'm going to go work <laughs> out. And it'll be like, don't worry, I'll take care of it. <laughs> It'd be like, oh, she's driving past yeah. that donut shop again. I'm uh, going to go ahead yeah. and put a little insulin on board. <laughs> I'm going to have a donut and then I'm going to lift weights and then I'm going to do cardio. Okay, work that out for me, would you please? Yeah. Yeah, that's that's really, I don't know, it's funny. So um, mo- moving forward, it says here, sometimes it seems like the system shows incorrect insulin on board. I didn't bolus and I'm in manual mo- mode. Should I have a zero IOB? Didn't this bolus. is a really great question, Scott. Okay. I, I I love the folks that are that are looking at this and noticing it because my husband tells me all the time. He's like, "You never look at your IOB. Why don't you ever look at your IOB?" So I think that's great that these people are noticing this and questioning it because it does work differently. So um, if you're coming from a standard insulin pump like Omnipod Dash or other other insulin pumps, then IOB has often historically been tracked by your boluses. So it's showing you the amount over, since your basal rate's already pre-programmed in these systems, then the amount you bolus as that bolus decays over the period of time that your insulin is actually working to bring down your glucose, Mm -hmm. it's showing you sort of that rate that your insulin is is being used up in your body. And that's what we expect to see from IOB. Well, the way it works in Omnipod 5 is that whether you're in manual mode or automated mode, the system knows what it has set as your adaptive basal rate. And that adaptive basal rate is obviously going to be going up and down from that flat number we said it was based on your glucose. Mm -hmm. And so the IOB is showing you that whether you're in manual or automated mode, how much insulin you're getting that is above the adaptive basal rate that's set by the system. Okay. And it can be a little bit challenging because you can't see what the adaptive basal rate is. Um, but when you're in manual mode and maybe you wake up in the morning and you see that you have a little bit of IOB, what it's showing you is that your regular basal for your manual mode program is probably a little bit higher than, than the system had set your adaptive basal rate. So it's showing you that little bump above what your adaptive basal rate is right. as IOB. I have to tell you that. Oh God, I'm that sorry. allows you to like switch between modes without sort of losing how your insulin is tracked. Okay. Okay. I, I've listened in what I do. I talk about this a lot, actually. Um, and it's interesting to watch people move from, you know, regular old insulin pumps to, you know, algorithm based systems, because th- the way I usually put it is before your IOB was almost a dummy number because it, it really is an indication of decay, but also based on how long you've told the pump insulin, your insulin action time is like, how long does this insulin last in my system? And you can go in the settings and tell it, you know, I think I bolus and it lasts for six hours. And then somebody else might go and tell it, I think it's three hours. So, you know, if you tell it three hours and put in five units, three hours later, it's going to tell you, you don't have any insulin on board. But if you're wrong about that, if insulin really lasts in you longer, six hours or whatever, then it would say, oh no, you have insulin left. We've only, you know, only this much of it's been used so far. It's it's been used as such a um, uh, I don't know. I mean, here's how I used to use it. I used to set the number lower so that the system would always want to give our insulin because I was trying to be aggressive. And that doesn't mean that's how much insulin's in your body and unaccounted for. It's just it was the best that those systems can do. New system here, Omnipod Five, is just it's thinking on a different level. I know thinking is the wrong word, but it's considering so much more than what had been considered in the past with, with older systems. So I, Absolutely. I, yeah. And you know, the, the Omnipod 5 bolus calculator is a smart bolus calculator, which means that it's also keeping in mind the trend of your glucose. Mm-hmm. And so uh, if you're going in, like the system needs to be able to track that IOB in a certain way in order to make good judgment calls about what, um, you know, what the trend of the glucose is how that's going to respond based on that insulin that's that's right. actually working in the body. Also, prior to Omnipod 5, most people were not used to doing things where the basal adjusted at all. Like every, right. everybody sets their basal and forgets it really. But, you know, Omnipod 5 is saying, here, take more basal. Oh, no, 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 give it back. You know, like here, t- give it back for a half an hour. And that's perfect. You know what? And then 10 minutes later, it might say, oh, maybe I should have done that for 20 minutes instead. So I'll give a little extra here to make it. It's constantly making those adjustments in ways that, I mean, you can't wrap your mind around if you're just a just a regular person, not a you know not an algorithm. So um, 
Okay, so cool. I'm, I'm glad that was a good question. And I do, t- you know, what you, I want to say you're 100% right. People online stun yeah. me sometimes with the depth that they consider these things and their kind of personal, I don't know, professional sometimes understanding of the world. And they'll ask the best questions. And, uh, you know, and I have some more here for you. So, well, I mean, nobody knows our diabetes like we do, right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, I mean, with all due respect to my healthcare team, like there are decisions that I, you know, I know how they've worked out for me in the past. And so when when a system works a little bit differently than your expectations and you have to manage those expectations in order to be successful in the system, like you do so much better when you have this information. And so I love that people ask it. Yeah, I, I agree. Okay, next question is, is it true that smart adjust technology learns only when I'm in automated mode? So the question is, can I go into manual mode and does that keep it from learning if I'm in manual mode? No, it does not. So it learns in manual mode um, because what is it learning? Total Total daily insulin. Daily insulin, right? So the next time you could go into manual for a whole pod or a whole weekend or whatever your whatever reason caused you to go into manual and you want to use manual mode. Um, you could go into manual mode and it's still going when you put a new pod on at your next pod activation, still going to update. This is how much insulin they're using per day. Mm -hmm. Um, Now in manual mode, of course, you're not getting that adjustment up and down and you're not getting that adaptive basal rate that's been set by the system, but you're still informing the total daily insulin that's used. So uh, that's, you know, that could be a, um, a strategy for, you know, sort of a, Rather than do a hard reset, think about, well, you know, is did I think my manual program worked better for me? Do I want to teach the system that that's closer to my, um, to my, the, the amount of insulin I think I should be getting? Yeah. Well, what about this scenario? So say I set it up, I set up Omnipod 5. I didn't tell it my total daily insulin was what it should be. I'm light, like I described before. And now I've been wearing it for a while and the system's learned, you know, it wasn't six, it wasn't 40, it was 60 and everything's copacetic. But then I go back into manual for some reason. Aren't I going back to the old settings that I put in? You are. Right. And so extrapolating that out to the idea of somebody growing, like a child getting bigger, putting on 10, 15 pounds over a year or something like that, or starting a menstruation or something like a big change in variable how often do people need to take their total daily insulin out of automated mode and go back and kind of tell manual mode, this is where we are now? Like, Because otherwise, if they need manual for some reason, they're very likely not going to have the, I, I'm not even saying the right amount. You could have started Omnipod 5 and overestimated how much insulin you needed, right? And, and it, Absolutely. Yeah. You know, that's such an important point, Scott. I think what I would recommend as a, as a person who uses this product is that you should be evaluating your settings with your healthcare team as often as you did on a non-automated system. Mm-hmm. It's The important thing to understand is that changing those manual settings will have zero impact on how the system performs in automated mode. But if you used to go to the endocrinologist and they, you know, or your CDE or whoever helps you make those settings adjustments, and that they would, um, you know, maybe they'd, they'd tweak this or that, or they'd change your basal program. They should still be doing that for the times that you want to use manual mode. Mm-hmm. And what they have now is they actually have the data of what your actual needs are from automated mode to be able to help you make those adjustments in manual mode. Yeah. But making the adjustment in manual mode is not going to optimize automated. I, I have more questions about that that are coming later that I'm um, actually tickled about getting to because of the frequency the people like literally come to me. I don't know if you know this, but every once in a while, people treat me like I'm a customer service representative for Omnipod. And, uh, and so they come to me and they say, I turned this switch. And I'm like, that doesn't touch auto. And they go, yes, it does. And I'm like, oh, I can't argue with you now. But like, I know it does. And I send them the information that's good, but I can't wait to go through them. I, I, just so you know, moving forward, I'm going to ask you about every setting and which ones actually impact what once you make changes to them after you're set up. So anyway, but first, <laughs> um, uh, this question says, I've heard that the first pod runs off my program basal program. Can I continue to make changes to my basal program until I start my second pod? To impact the algorithm. You cannot continue to make changes after you've entered that basal program during first time setup. So on your very first pod, 
you know, we mentioned that the Smart Adjust technology algorithm is 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 looking over your last few pods, right? So if you're starting the system as your very first pod, it doesn't have information about your past insulin use, right? So the only thing it has to go off is what you told it you use as a basal program. And so then the algorithm does its some internal math by by what you entered at first time setups and said, this is my basal program. And from that very first moment that you activate a pod, it tells your pod, this is what I think their total daily insulin is. And it sets an adaptive basal rate. If you go into auto mode on your very first pod, automated mode, it sets a basal, an adaptive basal rate that's based on that amount of insulin. It's not actually running your, your basal program that you entered. So if you had, let's say you had six segments that equaled um, a certain amount of insulin, uh, it's not running your 8 a.m. segment and then your noon segment and your 5 p.m. segment. It's running an adaptive basal rate that's based on that same total amount of insulin from your basal program. So basically, the the basal program that you entered for manual mode setup, you will use it when you're in manual mode. But the only thing that the automated mode is using it for is a reference to just kind of see like how much insulin do I think they're going to take as an adaptive basal rate. And this is an automated mode. In automated mode. Okay. So it's running the basals that are, it's running similar basals to what you programmed in, but it's already set that adaptive basal rate for you. And what that means is that from the moment you finish your first time setup, no change that you make to your settings is going to, because you already told the algorithm, you already fired the pistol and it's running. Yes. It's running down the track and there's no calling it back in to the stall. I, I've come down to just when somebody asks one of those questions and they're, I just go, no, it doesn't care anymore. Like it's, oh, it's, it's over now. <laughs> you, you, you told it what you told it and it's now making adjustments based off of what you told it. Um, yeah, you can't, you can't yell, oh, I'm so sorry. I meant to say, uh, that, that doesn't work. Yeah, like it, that. It's like when your 10 year old leaves the room after you already gave them an instruction, you're not, you're not amending it at that point. Like whatever they heard is what they heard. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm so close to asking. I, I probably should just jump ahead to the questions, but I'm trying to stay in order here. Um, is it true that Omnipod five will not deliver any insulin when my glucose value is below my target glucose? That is not true. Thank you. So <laughs> you feel very vindicated on I, some of this. I stuff. really do feel, I feel like somebody's finally standing behind me going, Scott's right. So uh, anyway. Scott's right. <laughs> um, you know, if, if your, if your spouse won't do it, then the, the folks here at Insulate will, right? Um, so you're right. Uh, essentially, remember that with, with all of these different AID algorithms, they're looking into the future, right? So Omnipod 5 is looking out an hour into the future. Now, um, for those of us who's, who've used CGM for a long time, we know that there's a big difference between a 100 that's flat, a 100 that's dropping, and a 100 that's rising. Mm -hmm. And if you know that you're dropping, rising, or stable, you're going to make different decisions about what you do with your insulin. And that's true for an algorithm like Smart Adjust Technology as well. Okay. So you could be, let's say your target is 120. And you could be 105 and you could see that it gives you more insulin than you expect, less insulin than you expect, no insulin at all, because it's looking out at where it thinks you're going to be an hour from now. Right, right. And so you can't judge based on just where the number is right now. Um, and remember that it's not just based on your CGM trend, but also its own internal workings of of what it knows about your insulin. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be making decisions based on where you're going to be. People who listen to this podcast will will recognize this sentence. Insulin used now is for later. It's not for now. You don't bolus at noon to make a difference at noon. You, you know, you make you bolus at noon to make a difference 20 minutes from now. That is only the starting of the difference. And then the insulin picks up, you know, momentum and starts working more efe efficiently as it gets in your body longer. And so the algorithm is saying, I think you're going to be 140 an hour from now. I need to give you insulin now so that insulin's working an hour from now when that rise tries to happen. And I think that is kind of next level thinking for a lot of people. So I could see why that confusion would happen. You know, the biggest thing that I imagine people are confused by is that if you go into uh, your history detail and you click on the auto events tab and you're seeing that, you know, you're, some people are seeing and going, wow, I was 84 and it delivered 0.05 units and um, 
like, why did it do that when I was so far below my target? And we don't think about the fact that on a traditional insulin pump, it was delivering that 0.5 or 0.05 or whatever every few minutes, no matter what your glucose was, because you were getting that consistent basal. So this is just a variable basal that's going like, in the next hour, I think you're going to have needed me now to deliver a little bit. Yeah, I find it helpful to just think, it must think, and then kind of fill in the blank afterwards. Like, oh, I wonder why it's taking my basal away. Oh, it must think I'm going to get low later. In old school systems, it's a safety setting. It's a safety setting. Yeah, right. Max max basal, max um, bolus, Max too. bolus. Right, right. Yeah, because, you know, think about this. Um, you know, we all have that, uh, you know, especially when folks first start out on insulin pumps, you're like, well, how will I make sure it doesn't give me more than I than I want? Or, you know, I'm leaving my child with a caregiver. How do I make sure that they don't accidentally misfinger, you know, one unit into 10 units? Uh, Well, if that max bolus is set at five units for that small child, then they're not going to do that. And so the max bolus and max basal are safety settings. The algorithm does not look at them. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and I I have a friend that was talking to me about this and, and saying like, but when I changed it, I saw a change. And to which I say, yeah, but the system learns your TDI every three days. So you were going to see changes regardless. Right. Um, I was going to say, so let me be the like, internet. Yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. It's kind of like um, if you told me that you tap danced a jig and sang a sea shanty every three days and it was having an impact on your total daily insulin, I would say, well, that's interesting. Have you tried not singing the sea shanty and see if you also see a change in your total daily insulin. <laughs> Turns out it might've just been the the exercise that was coming from the tap dancing. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I just, people, I the way I talk about it on the podcast is that people see ghosts all the time in diabetes. Oh, I know what happened. This happened, or I did this here. And I'm like, yeah, it's probably not that. I, I had, it, so feel disconnected for a second, but I had a person ask me the other night, I did a, um, um, I did a, an ask me anything online. And somebody showed me this graph and it was real, like, I don't know what's, I don't know how they were delivering their insulin, but uh, it was a pump. I don't, I don't know which one. And that it was a kid, high, then low, then high, then low, then high, then low. And they're like, what's wrong here? And I said, your sight's bad. Like, that's my first guess. My first guess is bad sight. And then here are my other guesses. Are you not pre bolusing And I went through the other things that I thought it could be. And then... The person replies back and goes, oh, this is a really old site. I was thinking of changing it tomorrow. And I was like, go ahead, change it now and see what happens. And two hours later, I get a message on Facebook. Hey, that fixed it. Like, that's it. Yeah. And and they could have gone in adjusted settings that would have like dramatically. You should have heard the things that she thought it could have been. She had these giant ideas of what happened. The other day he was sick and blah. And I was like, yeah, I think the site just doesn't look like it's working. And sometimes people skip over the obvious too. You know, yeah. one of my one of my favorite stories, um, a mutual friend of ours, Scott Johnson. I've heard him say many times in in his diabetes blog uh, that uh, the caveman who lived is the one who thought ahead of like all the possible things that could go wrong, mm-hmm. and that as people with diabetes, we are the caveman who survived. We are the ones who thought. Before we left the house, did I grab everything? Have I thought about this? Have I thought about this? And so we're constantly asked to to look for ghosts, and I think it's it's you know it's only natural that we're going to find them Sometimes when we look, them. right? Right, right, right. You know, I think it's important for people to understand that while the max basal and the max bolus are are safety settings, and the algorithm is not looking at it, that the algorithm is designed and has to be designed with its own internal safety settings. Mm-hmm. And the reason why you won't find what those safety settings are in, you know, in the user guide, for instance, is that in many ways they're tailored to you and your total daily insulin. And so your safety settings may change over time too. Like I, um, you know, I've had friends ask me about like, well, how come you have auto events that are like 0.4 units and mine are only 0.15? Like, how do I get mine to be 0.4? It's like, I have total daily insulin needs that are Greater twice than. what yours are yeah, right. my system has decided that it, it is it feels safe for me to go to a certain level and that's going to change over time if my insulin if i drop drop a bunch of weight my i'm going to see that my auto events change in response to that 
And that's, again, that's the way that the system is is looking at your total daily insulin and setting its own safety settings. So if people are getting that automated delivery restriction that's causing them to like jump in and, and do their max basal, mm-hmm. then what they actually need to do is is kind of look at those other settings that impact their total daily insulin and, and think about those. I think what a lot of people are learning as algorithms become popular is that they were achieving whatever they were achieving in the past, maybe through means that weren't, I don't, I don't know what the right word is. They, it, it might've been rigged a little bit, but still working for them, right? Like you hear some, pe- some doctors uh, are big fans of over basaling people because they think they're going to not bolus correctly with their meals. Like that's actually a thing a doctor will do. And so you could be using more basal than you need as that example and then moving into a system that doesn't care about that, it actually wants to know what the right answer is, not just what we made work over time. Um, and I think that's, I think people learn that a lot moving on to Omnipod 5 and, and oh, others. I, I think about the, have you ever heard the um, the story of the woman who cuts the ends off her pot roast when she cooks it? And her husband says, well, why do you do that? And she says, well, my mother did that. She always cut the ends of the pot roast. And yeah. then she asked her mother and her mother goes, well, my mother did it. And they go ask grandma and grandma's like, I had a short pan. <laughs> Like I'm, I'm, you know? I'm laughing so, because that that story is not only in my book, but it's in the it's in the podcast somewhere because I think it makes the point to people with diabetes like you don't just do something because somebody told you this is how it how it happens. You know, yeah, yeah. that's so funny you brought that and up. And it may have worked for you when you had a short pan, but maybe you don't have to do it anymore. Yeah. yeah. Oh, there you go. Omnipod five, not a short pan. Not a short pan. Yeah, that's free. For uh, yeah, your I PR don't think they'll go for that. No, no, no. Be 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 completely free to use that in any kind of marketing that you like. Uh, <laughs> so that four people understand what we're talking about. Uh, Next myth, adjusting my basal rates will help the algorithm in automated mode. Well, hopefully if folks have listened this far in, they're going to guess what the answer is. The answer is no. But again, as we said earlier, like it's still good to make adjustments to your manual mode rates so that when you go back to manual mode, it's reflective of the amount of insulin you're actually using today. Very important. And so, uh, but no, you know, for, um, I really feel for healthcare clinicians because like one of the first things they reach for in a lot of products and what they were trained to do for regular insulin pumps is to go in and adjust basal settings. And, uh, you know, that's, that was the lever they had to pull. And now that these systems, uh, sort of take over that piece of it, then they, you know, they have to learn to operate it a little bit differently. So, you know, I have heard people say, well, my doctor told me that I should still, um, you know, update the, the basal program and, um, and actually, the doctor may have said that because of the other reason, which is when you go back into manual mode, we want you to have those updated rates. Yeah. But hopefully they're looking at your other settings that would have a greater impact on your total daily insulin. I just had a conversation the other day on the show where this person told me they're an Omnipod 5 user and they went back to their physician because they were like, I think, you know, my settings need to be changed and everything. And she said that they were five minutes into the conversation when she stopped the doctor and said, you're giving me direction about a different system. For five minutes, that that person was giving you know giving them direction about using a completely different pump than what she was wearing, and she yeah. said the doctor just didn't know. It was fascinating. I'm sure that well, breaks your is, heart as a person who who's out there trying to share that knowledge with people, but it, that actually you know, it, that could happen. You know, it breaks my heart, but I have such empathy for my own endocrinologist because how many different systems does she have to support and mm-hmm. remember these little nuanced details? Yep. And, you know, I think they do a really good job. And I think all the companies have, have have really tried to give resources to our healthcare providers so that they can do that. But I think it's important, you know, and you would advocate for this and you always have with helping people be bolder with insulin. Like there's certain things where it pays for you to understand these nuances so that you can be your own advocate yep. for what needs to happen. So when you have that conversation with your doctor, you might have to say, you know, well, you remember that's only going to affect manual mode with the system. And then they, okay, well, let's look at these other settings. Yeah. So let's go over it. I'm going to test your knowledge here. You wrote the book, so you should know. What settings can I adjust in automated that impacts automated? Great question. Oh, please. It's the whole reason I'm here today. I'm super excited. <laughs> so, you know, I think Insulet has said really consistently and clearly that um, remember that this is uh, a system on the market today where you actually have different target glucose levels you can choose. Mm-hmm. And so if you want that, um, you know how we talked about the system isn't going to learn that, oh, I like oatmeal in the mornings or, oh, I go running in the afternoons. Um, but the system can be told that 
every afternoon, my kid has football practice and I want to, you know, maybe Timmy doesn't remember to use the activity feature because Timmy is 13 and it's a wonder he remembers to shower. So I'm going to adjust that um, target glucose in the afternoons to be, you know, 130, 140 instead of his usual 110 or whatever that that choice you make is. Um, and you can, by time of day, actually set different target glucose values. And so that could um, that could help in those kinds of situations um, mm-hmm. until Timmy learns to use that activity feature really consistently. Um, and so uh, definitely the target glucose is the very first lever that we recommend that you that you tap on. Okay. But more importantly, to my specific question, if I change my target in automated, it changes the automated mode to go for that target. Yes. Yes. And I ask that because... For instance, we've talked just a moment ago, if I change my basal rate, will that change my basal rate in the target? No, because the, right. the algorithm's already making new decisions. It doesn't want you anymore. It, you're just making changes to manual. What, what else can I change, if anything, in automated that actually impacts automated? So all of your bolus settings are very important. Now, obviously, you change your bolus setting and you're going to change how you bolus in both modes, right? So if I change my insulin to carb ratio, it's going to apply whether I'm in automated or manual mode when I'm bolusing. But because total daily insulin is what Omnipod 5 is learning, if you change the amount of insulin you're getting in a bolus, you're changing the overall amount of insulin you get in a day. That's your total daily insulin. And so, you know, We've said that the uh, that the system is trying to keep you pretty reasonably balanced between basal and bolus insulin. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, those folks who may start out over or under basaled, you're going to want that bolus and basal to be a little bit closer together in, in terms of balance, right? Which is, you know, clinically appropriate in um, and what they strive for in traditional insulin pumps is that sort of like, you know, 40 to 60, 50, 50 kind of like right. reasonably balanced, right? And so... Uh, changing the amount that gets moved over into the bolus category or moved out of the bolus category by changing your bolus settings can adjust that sort of balance between the basal and the bolus as well. So, you know, we have found that many people need to adjust their um, or, or you know, feel comfortable to, to uh, consider adjusting uh, certain things like their insulin to carb ratio, for instance, or their correction factor in order to just sort of change the amount of insulin they're getting. And again, you have to be careful because you're doing that in both modes. So you wouldn't want to do anything that, um, you know, hopefully you're working with a healthcare provider on, on changing the settings because you wouldn't want to get a bolus that was so large in manual mode right. that uh, that you wouldn't be able to compensate I for appreciate it. That was very clear. Thank you. Because I still, th- there are times that so many people come at me with these kind of misnomers online that I, I, I sometimes I question myself and I, I think to myself, like I made three like pretty deep dive episodes about Omnipod five. And I really feel like I understand this. And then they'll tell me something. I'm like, I don't think that's right. And so it, it's great to just hear it one more time. Insulin to carb ratio or correction factor. I change them. I'm changing them for both, but it's going to take some time for the algorithm to kind of dole out the insulin and decide where it goes, how much of it goes into basal, how much of it goes into uh, covering a meal or a correction factor. Absolutely. Okay. You know, and also consider that, um, you know, being on an automated system, you have to consider that when you bolus, that insulin now has to be sort of absorbed into the algorithm's math, Mm -hmm. right? And so some people may see that, oh, well, it stopped delivering basal once I put this bolus on board. And but that's what you want it to do because it's considering all of that insulin and it's when it's looking out an hour ahead. And so if you don't like the numbers that you're seeing or you don't like what it's the decision that it's making, then, you know, thinking about, well, how could I get a little more or less bolus in that um, in that bolus by adjusting those settings? Yeah. With my doctor? I think a terrific example could be that if you ate a meal with, I don't know, 40 carbs in it, but you for some reason told it it was 20 carbs, your blood sugar is going to sit high. And the algorithm is not going to think, oh, you need more insulin. It it thinks we did this already. Like, so yeah, yeah, it's going to, this is going to work at some point. It doesn't know you missed that egregiously on the carbs. So, you know, I I think you bring up an important point there because 
you, you talked about like sort of you miscalculate the number of carbs. Well, one thing that we know people do, we know because I'm guilty of it, I've done it in the past, um, is they put in fake carbs or ghost carbs. Mm-hmm. And there are systems where it kind of becomes the sort of community mentality of like, oh, well, you just put in some fake carbs. And the question is like, do you want to have to fake carb every day, every bolus, every meal? Right. Or do you want to make sure that your settings are accounting for the insulin that you actually want to deliver at meals and then not ever think about it again? So back to our earlier conversation about like, do the work, get the get the settings dialed in, and then you won't have to feel like you're lying to the system. Mm-hmm. And there are times too where there are, there are nutritional impacts. Like I'll, 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 I'll talk about something that's in the podcast that other people can go find. There are a ton of episodes about how to bolus for like protein or fat rises that you might see. Things that, you know, classically you'd say, well, there's no carbs in that, except, you know, I'm not going to go deep into it here, but if you eat French fries and a cheeseburger and it's on a roll, then the fat slows down your digestion and you could see a rise from the fat 60, 90 minutes after you've eaten. To bolus for that isn't a ghost, it's an actual impact, but it's not a carb. And that's where sometimes you're just going to have to up your game and understand the real impacts and the variables that are going on and not sometimes not just say, well, I don't know. I counted it. I did the thing. I don't know why it's not working. Yeah, you know? I, I do the same thing, Scott, for coffee. I've always sure. had to take a little insulin for coffee. And so I know what my calculation is to do that. It's not carbs per se, but I know mm-hmm. that it's insulin that I need for the impact it has on my glucose. That's not quite what I'm talking about in terms of like, I'm talking about people saying oh, I, I ate 20 when I didn't. Yeah, yeah no, yeah. I, I know. I, I, I know. I'll clear up just in case I was unclear, but I know exactly what you're saying. When your settings are weak and you're just pretending you ate carbs to give the system more insulin, you just, just fix your settings or figure out what you're doing wrong. Like don't do that forever because that becomes monotonous after a while and then you will forget to do it. And then- you know, then you get everything that comes with it. And coffee's an amazing example, by the way, because you can flip a coin meeting someone with type one. Some people need to bolus for it and some people don't need insulin for it at all. Yeah, Absolutely. fascinating. So, okay. Um, I think we're down to like our last little bit here. It's it's just this, these words that are here that make me think about every person I've seen online talk about Omnipod 5 or God, almost anything in diabetes, really. How do I game the system? People are always looking for a way to make the thing work. And you just kind of went over it there a little bit with the ghosting the carbs. But there is no gaming this system, right? Like, this thing's smarter than I am. It's thinking about more than I am. It's considering more than I could probably even consider. Trying to get around it would probably just be setting up, uh, setting myself up for failure at some point, I think. But I want to know what you think about it. Well, you know, I, and and I'm guilty of saying it's smarter than me too. But I, I want to say that a little bit differently, Scott, because... It's not, you know, I gave this system a job so that I don't have to think about it. Mm-hmm. And so if I'm going to come in and just keep fighting with the system to try to to try to force fit it to to work for me, then I have saved myself none of the trouble that that it was supposed to like, you know, at the end of the day, like I I almost feel bad that I've said like do the work because what I'm talking about is a tiny tiny little bolus of work uh, to get the settings right so that you don't have to do work every day to fight against the system. So I'm going to tell you a little bitty story Mm -hmm. of how I tried to think, well, you know, I know how the algorithm works. I'm going to game it a little bit. So um, when I started the system, I thought, well, okay, I know how much insulin I need. And maybe that's not exactly what uh, what I've dialed in. And so I'm going to, so I basically lied to it about how much basil that I needed because I was like, I want the system to like, I'm going hot. I want to be aggressive. I'm insulin resistant. Um, And within a couple of days, it was like, Melissa, you don't take that much insulin. You need to stop. Um, Now it's not sassy with me, but it essentially like within a few pods, it had put me at the actual insulin needs that I had. And so all of that, like trying to outthink it and trying to outsmart it, um, all it did was, was waste my time because the system was adapting to my total daily insulin and it reached its conclusion about the insulin I actually ba- need for basal and actual bolus with. And so it um, it didn't actually buy me anything to to do that other than make me feel a little bit foolish in the end for thinking that like I could obscure from the system that is literally its job that I have assigned it is to track how much insulin I take yeah. that I could somehow hide from it. Well, I will I will jump in this pool. Uh, with you so you don't feel alone. Um, when I put Omnipod 5 on Arden, 
I did not make her insulin to carb ratio aggressive enough. Um, and then to get around it, I thought, oh, I'll just put it in manual so it can't cut basal. And then her blood sugar came crashing down. And I was like, oh, this was completely wrong. <laughs> so I, you know, like I did the same thing. I thought, oh, I can, I, I'll get around it. I don't know. Isn't that interesting? Like, why is the first inclination to people like, how do I game this instead of how do I get this set up correctly so that it doesn't happen anymore? It is really you know, interesting. It's, it's trust though, right though? I mean, how yeah. many devices have you and Arden used over all of this time? I mentioned that I've had like 16 insulin pumps. Like if we, if, if I had six, well, first of all, if I had had 16 pumps that just always worked, I probably wouldn't have bounced around until I found the one that I wanted to use. Right. But, uh, you know, we've, We've been taught in diabetes, particularly for you as a caregiver, um, but also it, it counts for me as a as a person with type one. We've been taught like you're gonna have to figure this out for yourself. Yeah, it's all on you. You've got this huge cross you have to bear. You've got this burden. You're gonna have to figure this out. And so, like giving up trust to to a system is is really hard. Mm. And what's funny is there are places in our lives where we're more than happy to give up trust. I mentioned that I have a smart thermostat. I don't check its work every, you know, 30 minutes to see if it made the decision about my cooling habits that I want it to make. I just I just give it up. But diabetes we've had to we've had to hold so close yeah. that um that it's hard to develop that trust. So I don't blame people for trying it's to game good, it. I'm just telling you that yeah. if if it if it didn't work for you and me, I you know, I feel like um most people are going to have the same experience. Honestly, Melissa, it's a great point. The first time I got into a car that said it drove itself, I was like, cool. And I pushed the button. I was like, let it do it. <laughs> I didn't think twice, right? I saw I saw this and I'm like, that's not right. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I know better. I yeah. Well, you know, think about how many hours and how many brain cycles you've given to diabetes. Like how could, how could a mathematic equation in a system like Omnipod 5 be able to do that for you? Like it's a trust exercise. Yeah. And I think that... Um, you know, it's important for us to remember at Insulate as we're developing the materials to kind of get you up and running to think about like, you know, what will help you feel like you can trust this system. And, um, you know, and so that's something we're thinking about every day. Wow, that's amazing. Well, I really do appreciate you coming on and doing this with me. I, I can't thank you enough. I also want to thank you for listening to this three-part series, Ask the Expert, Omnipod 5. If you're telling me right now, oh, Scott, I didn't know there were other episodes. There sure are. There was two other ones. Did you not hear them? You got to go right now. Episode 1 with Eric Davenport, Ask the Omnipod 5 Training Expert. And Episode 2, Lindsay Friedman, Ask the Omnipod 5 Product Support Expert. Three essential conversations with three Omnipod employees, all who have type 1 diabetes and all who wear Omnipod 5. These episodes are, of course, available in the audio app you're listening in right now or at juiceboxpodcast.com slash Omnipod 5. If you'd like to get started with Omnipod 5, please consider using my link, omnipod.com slash juicebox. And absolutely do not miss the Omnipod 5 Pro Tip Series at episode 736, 737, and 738. They are incredibly important as you set up your Omnipod 5 system. Thank you so much for listening. I'll be back very soon with another episode of the Juicebox Podcast.